Okay, so we're going to look at the June 2004 unified paper. So the first thing is a question is about uh, making some estimates. Um, we're going to need to give our answers in SI units, but we're going to need to do reasoned estimates. So we need to be able to justify how we've come up with our answer. So the first one we need to come up with is the power of an electric kettle. So the way I reason this is, well, a kettle is plugged into the mains at 230 volts. And most of them have a 10 amp fuse inside them if you open up the plug. So therefore, using P equals IV, you figure out the power is roughly 2.3 kilowatts. So anywhere in this kind of range would be totally acceptable. So if you've got something in the order of kilowatts, certainly in the low kilowatts, you'd have a very reasonable answer. The speed of a good sprinter, uh, so the world record I think is 9.43 seconds for 100 meters, but so the way I reason for it is 100 meters in about 10 seconds gives a velocity of 10 meters per second in SI units. Uh, the speed of a car on a motorway, so uh, most people will probably go above 70, but let's say the average is about 70 miles per hour. I'm going to then convert that into meters per second because we have to give them in SI units. So that's about 31 meters per second. Kinetic energy of a good sprinter. So I reason, well, their velocity or speed is about 10 meters per second. Their mass is probably about 100 kilograms. They're fairly muscular people generally. So that's going to give us 5,000 joules of kinetic energy. The resistance of a domestic light bulb when it is on. So most bulbs are rated around 100 watts. Some of them are about 60 watts, somewhere around there. They're plugged into mains at 230 volts. So using P equals V squared over R, that allows us to figure out what the resistance is. And I got about 530 ohms. The number density or the number per unit volume of molecules in the atmosphere given that the density of air is about one kilogram per meter cubed. So the first thing I did is air is 80% nitrogen. So I said, well, let's just say it's 100%. So the mass of one mole of nitrogen molecules is 28 grams because it goes around as an N2 molecule and a nitrogen mole is 14 grams. So uh, they're going to get 28 grams per one mole of nitrogen molecules. So what that means is that the atmosphere is 35.7 moles per meter cubed uh, by essentially doing 1,000 divided by 28. Then multiplying by Avogadro's number, that gives us 2.2 times 10 to the 25 molecules per meter cubed as the number density in the atmosphere. So moving on to question two, name the quantities which are defined below they are all rates of change with time. So the rate of change of displacement is the velocity. The rate of change of electrical charge is the current. Rate of change of velocity is acceleration. Rate of change of the number of radioactive nuclei is the activity. And the rate of doing work is power. So fairly straightforward there. Moving on to question three, outline two experiments which can be done to show that there are three different types of radiation from naturally occurring radioactive materials. So the first one is very commonly known using different barriers to show there are three different penetrating abilities of radiation. So you should know that paper blocks alpha, thin metal blocks beta, and only thick lead can block gamma. So we can use the penetration to show there are three types. But the other type would be if we use either an electric or a magnetic field, because gamma particles are neutral, so they will be unaffected by the field. And then alpha and beta have opposite charges, so they'd be deflected in opposite directions by those two fields. Uh, so those would be two very sensible strategies to show there are three types of radiation. And the magnetic field method is, in fact, one of the first ways that the three types were identified and they were given the names alpha, beta, and gamma for the first three letters of the Greek alphabet. Okay, so then the apparatus for an experiment to show that alpha particles are helium nuclei is illustrated by the diagram. 
So we've got pipette, which is evacuated, so it's a vacuum, and sealed at one end. The other end connected to a rubber U-shaped filled with mercury, as we can see. A strong alpha source with an activity of 7.7 .7 times 10 to 9 Baccarel and a very long half-life is placed inside the pipette. Okay, so that's the information we need. Show that the number of alpha particles which are emitted by the source in six weeks is 2.8 times 10 to the 16. So using the fact that half-life is long, we're going to assume the activity remains pretty much fixed. So just multiply the activity by the time in seconds gives us the number of alpha particles, 2.8 times 10 to the 16. And the reason we needed to know it had a very long half-life is so we can assume the activity is constant during that period of time. Because if it had a short half-life, we'd have had to account for the change in activity. Calculate the number of moles of helium which have been formed during the six weeks. So essentially, we know how many particles have been formed. So if we divide by Avogadro's number, that will work out the number of moles of helium, 4.6 times 10 to the minus 8. To become helium atoms, each alpha particle must gain two electrons. Where could 5.6 times 10 to the 16 electrons come from? Well, the thing to realize is the nucleus that emits the alpha particle still has electrons orbiting it. And even though it's emitted an alpha particle, it's still got the same number of electrons. So that must mean the atom has developed a very big negative charge. And that's where the source of our electrons is gonna come from. So the source that was emitting the radiation is going to be very negative and you can get a lot of electrons from there. So the volume of the pipette in which the helium is stored is 0 0.000050 meters cubed and its temperature is 20 degrees. Use the ideal gas equation to calculate the pressure of helium at the end of the six weeks. So we can use this equation. We know N, we know R, we know T and we know V. As long as we convert temperature to Kelvin, we can get the pressure is 2.3 pascals, which is incidentally a very, very small pressure, especially compared to atmospheric pressure, which is 10 to the power of five. Okay. So the pressure calculated in the last question is very small. So at this stage, the level of mercury in the right-hand tube is raised. This forces all of the helium into the top narrow part of the pipette and so raises the pressure. This narrow part is fitted with two electrical contacts and when a high voltage is connected across them, the helium glows because uh, the helium has become ionized essentially. It becomes a dim fluorescent lamp. State a possible range of values for the wavelength of the helium light. Suggest how it can be confirmed that this emitted light is from helium. So is it it glows, which means we can see the wavelengths that are being emitted. So we know they're in the visible spectrum, 400 to 700 nanometers. So the way we could verify it from helium is we could use a spectrometer to measure the wavelength. And what we would do is compare it to the emission spectrum of helium to confirm that some of the wavelengths produced are the wavelengths that are characteristic for helium. Okay, so moving on to question four. On the axis drawn, sketch graph to show the following quantities vary with distance. Uh, tension in an elastic band. Uh, so this graph would look something like this. Um, so elastic band, the graph is a fairly strange one. It's initially roughly a straight line, but then we get these curved sections. The force required to pull up a weed from the ground. Uh, so initially, you have to provide a large amount of force to loosen it from the ground, but then we just need to supply a force equal to the weight force to keep it pulling up, so the force is reduced. Gravitational field strength as the distance from the Earth's surface increases. So uh, the field strength is going to drop, and field strength has an inverse square kind of relationship, so we expect a graph that asymptotes towards the x-axis. The uniform electric field between charged parallel plates, 
well, field strength is constant in a uniform field. And the electric field strength at distance from a point charge, again, we're going to end up with a graph showing an inverse square relationship. Okay, so moving on to question five. Many homes have a microwave cooker as well as a conventional cooker. Microwaves have a frequency of 2,450 megahertz, which is what's used in them. What type of waves are microwaves? Uh, they're a part of the electromagnetic spectrum, so they're an electromagnetic wave. I guess we could argue they're a transverse wave too. And calculate the wavelength of microwaves of this frequency. Well, we know the speed of all electromagnetic waves. We know their frequency, so it's fairly straightforward to work out the wavelength. The microwaves heat the food in a cooker because they cause the water molecules in the food to oscillate with high amplitude at the same frequency as the microwaves. What name is given to this forced oscillation? Well, that's clearly resonance, where you get a large amplitude with a frequency match. Okay. So a 600 watt microwave cooker is used to heat 0 0.20 kilograms of water from 20 degrees to 100 degrees. So the heat capacity is 4,200. Calculate the time for heating. So the general equation we're going to use is Q equals MC delta T, but we've got power and time, so we can substitute that in for Q and rearrange to make T the subject, plug the values in, and you end up with 112 seconds. Microwave cookers are said to heat food quickly. Suggest why microwave cooking can be quicker than cooking in a conventional oven. Explain why a 1200-watt ring heating uh, 0.02 kilograms of water in a saucepan will take longer than the answer you obtained in C. And explain why it would be quicker to use a ring rather than a microwave oven if a large casserole needed heating up. Okay, so let's address that point by point. So, the key for microwaves is that they can be absorbed by any part of the food. So, that means the center of food can be absorbing microwaves as easy as the surface of food. Whereas if you're using a conventional cooker, the surface of the food has to absorb the energy and then it has to be conducted into the center. And it means it takes a lot longer with a conventional or that microwaves are much faster. So why would a ring with twice the power take longer than the answer we got before? Because when we're using a normal oven, we are using energy to heat the saucepan, and we're also losing a lot of heat to the surroundings, both of which are going to result in a longer time, even though the power is twice as big. So then last one, why would you use a cooker rather than a microwave oven? Well, in this situation, having twice the power is going to be beneficial because you're trying to supply a large amount of energy to a very big item, therefore the extra power is going to reduce the time it takes, even though you need some time for conduction. Okay, so the microwaves themselves are generated inside the cooker in a device known as a reflex clistron. In this clistron, a beam of electrons from the electron gun passes up and down past the cylindrical cavity as shown in the diagram. Electric fields of this beam cause a stationary wave oscillations in the cavity in much the same way as a stream of air passing in an organ pipe sets up a stationary sound wave in the pipe. Okay, so what is meant by a stationary wave? So uh, it's a wave that stores energy rather than transmitting it from one place to another. And it's formed from two progressive waves with the same speed and frequency traveling in opposite directions. So one theory gives the radius of the cylindrical cavity in terms of the permeability of free space and the permittivity of free space. Where F is the frequency of the microwave, use the values from the formula sheet to figure out the radius of the cavity used in a microwave cooker. Uh, so this is basically straightforward plug numbers in and do a calculation. And if you do that, you end up with a radius of 0 0.039 meters or 3.9 centimeters, a very reasonable size for a microwave oven. So what effect would be 
on the size of the microwave cookers if the frequency required was 245. Well, that's going to change things quite considerably. So to get 10 times the frequency, we need 10 times the radius. So instead of the radius being 3.9, the radius is now 39, or the diameter is now essentially 80 centimeters. And if you've looked at a microwave oven recently, you will see they're all much smaller than that. So if your diameter was 80 centimeters, you're gonna to need to make your microwave a lot bigger. Suggest the principle you'll be used in designing the electron reflector in the clistron in the diagram. So if we're gonna reflect electrons, it makes sense for us to make material out of something negative. So if we charge it up, so it's a negative plate, that's gonna repel the electrons and cause them to be reflected. Okay, so that completes this uh, paper looking at unified physics. If you have any questions, please feel free to comment and let me know. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. But thank you for taking the time to watch.